Hello there. This is Dave. Sean. And we're here to bore you with law and IP. So welcome to Metatopia 2021 online. I am going to go ahead and share our slides and then we will talk through our introductions. Okay. All right, well, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. So first, before we get into the substance, we're lawyers, so we have to have a brief disclaimer. We're not going to read the whole thing, but in summary, today's presentation is for informational purposes only. Nothing that we say should be considered to be formal legal advice. We are lawyers, but we're not your lawyers. So even if we respond to a specific question you have, that is not formal advice. If after today's talk, you have some specific questions you might uh, think would be helpful with in a more formal situation, we're happy, happy to help. So with that having been said, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the legal life cycle of game development and protection and what you can protect and how you protect it at every step along that path. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the agreements um, that are probably going to be relevant to you at various points. Um, and then hopefully we're going to have some Q&A uh, either during presentation or at the end if we have uh, enough time. Uh, also, who are we? So my name is Sean Owens. Uh, I'm a trademark and a copyright attorney. I've been practicing since 2009. Uh, gamer since birth. Um, and as noted, there, a uh, constant nemesis of Cthulhu uh, and repeated savior of Hyrule. Yes, I am very excited for the sequel to Breath of the Wild. That's me. Here's Dave. So I'm Dave Fitzgerald. I have uh, been a patent and trademark attorney since about 2008. Uh, I have a background in mechanical engineering, which is why I spend most of my day job doing patent work. Uh, but I've built up a pretty healthy practice in licensing agreements and trademarks, specifically in this field, because uh, I've been a gamer since birth, and that's what I'm passionate about. Uh, so for my gaming experience, uh, currently, Still very much in Pokemon Go. The game is five plus years old and still going strong, uh, which is a bit of a surprise. And then uh, Hearthstone and tabletop games across the board um, regularly have gone to Gen Con, Origins, you name it, and regional conventions for quite some time. And always bringing home some new boxes as uh, when I'm on camera, you can see behind me. Unfortunately, many of them still in seal wrap. Uh, a brief introduction to our firm. Our firm is just an intellectual property law firm, which means all we do is patents, copyrights, trademarks, privacy law, uh, those associated areas. If you need a divorce, we're not the attorneys for you and thankful for that. Uh, we are in Cincinnati, Ohio, as we'll describe later, that doesn't really matter uh, because all intellectual property practices, at least in the US, are for the most part nationwide. Uh, we currently have about 35 attorneys, including Sean and myself, and we run the gamut across all the different areas uh, associated with IP laws I mentioned before. Okay, and so here's sort of the roadmap for today's discussion. We're going to talk through each of these different points um, along the path of game development and what area of law uh, or areas of law are going to be most relevant. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to cover the high points of those different areas as to how you get protection things to watch out for, mistakes we see, those sorts of things. So first, you're probably going to just start with an idea, a concept of some sort. And that idea could take a number of different forms. Um, so here are just some silly examples. Uh, a social deduction hidden trader game set in a high school, uh, set in high school social circles. That sounds terrifying. Um, or Mansions of Madness meets Candyland. Maybe you see you know, two existing games and you imagine you could do a mashup of some sort, either with the underlying mechanics for the actual themes uh, of the games. Or uh, a Game of Thrones deck builder uh, with companion augmented reality app. So this is an existing property, not a game property, but a creative property of some sort, which you are then applying to an original game that you're gonna come up with, which with also perhaps a, a digital component. So, so these are all ideas or concepts. And at this very early stage, what can you do to protect them? Well, um, the short answer is not a lot as long as you, or, uh, unless you keep them secret, okay? And that's where trade secret law comes in. The requirement for protection of trade secret law is that whatever your idea or concept is, you keep it a secret. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean you have to maintain absolute secrecy. You can use contracts with people to maintain that secrecy so you can still share the idea with them. We call these typically confident, uh, confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements, NDA, you might also hear. 
These agreements will also often have non-commercialization provisions in them so that not only are you allowed to share the material with someone and they're not going to share with anyone else, but they're also not going to use it in any way. They're not going to commercialize it themselves. If someone violates their trade secret, that is, if they sign an agreement that they're not going to share it and then they, in fact, do share it, okay, then you could potentially seek damages uh, or even an order from a court that will limit the disclosure. They might not have shared it very much, so you can get a court to shut that down further. And while uh, non-disclosure agreements are useful throughout the developmental process, um, it's really at this early stage where if you want to protect, again, just the idea or concept, this is really the only option that you have. Um, if you're going to be sharing things outside of this, if you're going to be really sharing what you thought was a secret and it's not a secret anymore, well, then you don't have protection anymore either. So that's really, in a nutshell, trade secret law and what you can do to protect ideas or concepts. But eventually, you're going to start coming up with your rules, your mechanics, the, functional, the functional elements of your game. And that's where patent law is going to come in, which Dave is going to cover. Any questions about trade secrets before we jump into patents? Uh, nothing yet. Okay. We'll open back up after patents. Mm -hmm. So you're putting together some rule sets, maybe even uh, doing a first draft of the rule book, or you're putting together the core functionalities of how your game or game product is going to come together. And this is the, the place where patent law is the intellectual property that would come in, and specifically utility patents. We will talk about design patents a little bit later, but utility patents protect useful functional inventions. And the examples that I, I give are the rule sets and the mechanics, or what is often the case, especially in modern board game, tabletop game patents, are unique combinations of components or devices, whether they be software electronic oriented or uh, mechanical on the tabletop oriented, they're used in conjunction with certain game rules and mechanics. Uh, so these are the things that you can protect with a patent. Patents are very expensive and they're very difficult to get because they are effectively a monopoly uh, in that field on the claimed invention for 20 years from the filing date if it gets granted in the country where you seek it. You do have to overcome some hurdles, those being novelty, non-obviousness, and uh, not being just an abstract idea, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, for novelty, it means you're different than, at least in some small way, from anything else that has come before. Non-obvious is where the patent attorneys make their bucks, though, because you also have to be something that, if an ordinary designer in that field would have found it obvious to combine or modify things that are in existence to come up with your set of mechanics or your set of components, then that's what's called obviousness. It is a massive gray area, and indeed, it is uh, the most difficult hurdle to overcome for most patent applications. Uh, that being said, that's why you get legal counsel, because uh, we make those arguments every single day, and uh, they are just as much law as they are technical arguments. So if you get a patent, what does it allow you to stop? Well, as I mentioned, it's basically a, a monopoly. It allows you to stop competitors from making, using, selling, or importing that invention into the country or territory where you have it. So think of it like a fence around the country where you have the patent. A couple examples just to illustrate the point that are a little bit more historical. Uh, one in this field is the Square Shooters Poker Dice game. Uh, for this patent, you can see on the cover sheets that it is just one particular set of poker dice. And I use this as an example both because it is in our field, but it also was a really good example of how your marketing story or shtick can match up with what makes you a uh, patentable invention. So they did the combinations of permutations to come up with the only way that you could apply on nine six-sided dice the classic 52 cards and a deck of cards and two jokers so that you could roll every possible poker hand. And if you make any variation from this layout, if you switch the ace of spades and the two of clubs, you no longer can roll at least one of the, the poker hands. Uh, and so there was some pretty incredible math and, and <laughs> combinations that went into this. And they use that as their marketing. If you were at conventions about 10 years ago, that's how they marketed their game, as we are the superior set of poker dice. 
certainly poker dice have been around forever, but their point was that none were able to, in a nine six-sided dice context, roll every possible poker hand. And that was also sufficient to overcome those novelty and non-obviousness hurdles. So they were able to get a patent, albeit a very narrowly tailored patent, because of course you can come out with competing poker dice, uh, but you just cannot copy this particular way to put those 54 cards on those 54 faces of the nine dice. And then, of course, we have Magic the Gathering. Uh, Richard Garfield, back with Wizards of the Coast, uh, basically generated a whole new field of gaming. And it is in those cases where you do get really broad or have the potential to get really broad patent protection. And he did. So not only did he cover sort of the core mechanics, putting together a deck of 60 cards with no more than four of a particular card, these were some of the, the rule mechanics that were in some of their claims, but they were able to cover very broadly some isolated aspects of CCGs, uh, including, of course, the most famous turning a card 90 degrees to show that it's been used, which we all know is tapping, which is their trademark that, that covers that action. But they had claims as broad as that, that could cover turning a card 90 degrees to show that it's been used. Uh, and that forced other card game designers, because of course the field populated with a lot of CCGs thereafter, to design around those patent claims, meaning they had to use tokens or some other way to show that the card had been used. Uh, and they had to do that for 20 years, uh, which those patents are now expired on Magic, but only very recently so. Typically, we go through some 2021 examples. I'll just point out a couple of things about these uh, for today's talk, since we have a little bit of limited time. And that is that a lot of the current patent examples you see in our field are, again, these implementations of either digital plus tabletop. Uh, the bottom example here is a way that you could have two remote boards from one another. Uh, think very much uh, like online tabletop gaming, except that you actually have functional pieces in a board that are communicating with an app that then you know, communicates with your other player who is somewhere else. So rather than being on a software platform, you are actually you know, playing on a board. Um, and the way that that communication works is, is kind of what they were able to patent. And then other examples are the, the pieces you see on the board or the score, the electronic score tracker you see on the board, those in combination with certain rules, uh, those were things that were able to get issued patents in the US. So if you come to us at this early stage and you are interested in patents, uh, what I will likely recommend to you is that you file what's called a provisional application if you're, United, if you're based in the United States at least. And uh, that allows you to file a patent application without formalized drawings and without formalized claims. Uh, that will cut your cost for working with an attorney to prep that application by 50% or more. Uh, that provisional application doesn't issue as a finalized patent. In fact, it never becomes public knowledge unless you continue to the non-provisional. Uh, but it does buy you a year, basically, to then have your application on file and test the marketplace some more, refine your design some more, uh, and find out if it's worthwhile to invest in the non-provisional. Uh, then the non-provisional, you have to have those formalized drawings, some examples of which you saw there on the previous pages, and you have to have the claims, which are the numbered elements at the end of a patent that define what you have the right to exclude others from doing. So, Timing and cost, uh, unfortunately with patents, it's very expensive and it's also very time sensitive, meaning the governments, not just the US, but all around the world, they do not like to give away these monopolies, but they do so because they do want to uh, reward innovation and then allow for disclosure of those innovations so that the, the science can move forward uh, after that exclusive term of 20 years. So if you, go into the marketplace and you do a public disclosure or a sale or an offer for sale, you trigger what's called a bar date. And in the US, you then have one year from that original public disclosure or sale to file a patent application. If you don't do that, you will not be able to file a patent application at that point because your own prior disclosure will stop you or bar you from doing so. If you are a foreign company that uh, works in Europe, for example, which is often in, in this marketplace, their grace period is basically non-existent. So uh, they have a little different legal definition of what becomes a public disclosure. 
Uh, but regardless, you basically want to be in advance if you're interested in patents at all. And for cost, as I mentioned, these are going to be the most expensive things we talk about. For a provisional working with an attorney, you're typically looking at 2000 to 4000 The filing fee is only 100 or 200 bucks, uh, but writing the disclosure and putting together a good provisional application will still cost you a few thousand. And then the non-provisional in this field is typically seven to $10,000 working with an attorney. And again, your filing fees at the US Patent Office are gonna be in the thousand to $2,000 range, depending on the size of your company. And if you extend that out and, and then pursue foreign filings, those numbers will just increase exponentially, basically, because you're gonna pay that type of fee for a local attorney and for filing fees in each country where you seek a patent. Uh, just briefly, some common mistakes we see relative to patents. A lot of folks think that you have to have a patent to practice your invention, and that's not true at all. Uh, patents are just a business asset that allow you to exclude others from competing with you. So they are not necessary at all to go into business. Uh, and in fact, they are quite rare in this field uh, as to tabletop and, and role-playing games. The one thing that I do want to caution you against, though, is, is not to assume that there's nobody out there with patents, because there are still companies, as I showed you some examples, that are securing patents. And it does you a lot of good to make sure that you're not infringing on any surprise patents. So a little bit of clearance work is probably warranted uh, when your design is firmed up enough to where you can search that and, and or talk with an attorney about it. So then uh, that pretty much covers patents. Uh, I've gone through it relatively quickly and we would move on to name and brand, but uh, are there any questions? If you have a patent um, and you know somebody else, you've had a patent for a certain amount of time and uh, somebody else wants to use your patented mechanic or something and you grant them that right, you sell them that right, um, are you in any danger of like weakening your own uh, 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 control of that if, uh, if, if it becomes a you know, commonly available mechanic? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Relative to mechanics, no. Um, if you have a patent, uh, and again, this assumes that you're licensing instead of assigning, it's just a, a difference in terminology and, and to the rights that you're granting. If you actually assign your patent to somebody, then you've given up control and they're the ones who right. would have control. But if you're just licensing the right, which is, of course, one of the ways that you get your money back on patents, uh, then no. And unlike trademarks, which we'll talk about in a little bit in trade dress, where you do have to police against uh, things kind of <laughs> uh, genericizing your mark um, or become less distinctive in the patent field, it's really black and white. Once you have the patent right, it's not something that's by lack of use or lack of policing that you lose. Basically, you, you pay the maintenance fees and the annuities uh, and you keep it for the entire 20 year term. So there's, there's not as much impetus. And in fact, if you read news articles about patent law, you will see patent trolls or non-practicing entities are a constant theme in our field. And the reason for that is uh, the companies will file, you know, sometimes on things that they don't have the ability to manufacture or put into place, uh, but they did come up with the idea. So they file on the patents and they get it. And then they just try to license that later um, and extort fees from companies that can manufacture. But as to owning a patent, you don't give up the rights basically by licensing. There's no risk there as, as to this. Okay, that's what we got. Yep. Okay, and that brings us to the next phase of our game development life cycle where you've put together a nice set of rules and functions. Uh, you've probably got some prototypes working, and now you want to put together uh, some naming or some brands, how you're going to identify yourself in the marketplace and, and how you're going to sell yourself. And for this, I'll turn it back over to Sean. Okay, so you start to come up with a, the name of the game. Okay, that's the brand, the trademark. There might also be a slogan associated with it. Uh, you're also going to start coming up with perhaps some of the actual content of the game, the look of the game, the look of packaging, the look of the game itself. Uh, and a lot of this falls under uh, the area of trademark law or trade dress law. I'll explain the difference in just a second. But generally speaking, what this area of law does is it protects names, logos, slogans uh, of products or services that are being offered for sale uh, or even just given away. Um, it's really anything that it identifies the source of a product that can function 
as a, uh, as a trademark. So in this field, the name of a company, uh, the name of a game itself, a game series, logos, again, slogans, unique packaging elements, uh, or appearances. Uh, and the point of having a trademark is that you can then prevent others from selling similar products under similar brands. And the goal with trademark law is to prevent consumers from being confused. So that when they go to the game shop and they see a game on the shelf, they know, oh, that's from this particular manufacturer or that's part of this particular series of games. And they're not confused as to who's producing it, what the content is going to be, that sort of thing. And unlike patent law, unlike a patent, which can last for at most 20 years from the date of filing, uh, a trademark uh, can last potentially forever, so long as the trademark is being used with your products and it's otherwise functioning uh, as a trademark. Part of that is also what Dave mentioned a moment ago about uh, policing your mark, making sure it's not being infringed upon. Uh, so what are some uh, examples uh, of different trademarks? So it could be a word or a series of words uh, like Settlers of Catan. Uh, it could be just a graphical element, a logo, uh, like on the left there you see uh, the logo for Privateer Press. Uh, in the middle it could be a, a, a character element uh, in your game, that's of course Mario from Nintendo. And on the right, uh, we see an example of trade dress. So this is the back of a CCG. I'm sure that uh, everyone knows what this is, even though I've blocked out uh, the primary word trademark. That is, of course, Magic the Gathering. All of these things can function as trademark or trade dress uh, for your games. <clears throat> One thing that I'll interject is for the Settlers of Catan example, brands do change over time and then you can re-register. So in this case, Catan became its own brand uh, separate from Settlers of Catan. So how do you get protection for, for these? Well, you have two options. Unlike patent law, where unless you have a patent, you basically got no rights at all, okay? Uh, in trademark law, if you just start selling or distributing your game under a particular brand, you will automatically start to develop what are called common law or unregistered rights. Uh, and those rights are enforceable in the geographic region where you are actually selling your game. So if you're selling across the US, you would potentially have rights throughout the US, but if you're only selling locally at first, you would just have rights in your local geographic region. The alternative is to pursue a federal trademark registration, also granted by the US Patent and Trademark Office. A federal registration is not necessary for protection. Again, you can just rely on common law or unregistered rights, but it does provide a number of benefits, uh, including presumption of nationwide rights, uh, even if you aren't selling everywhere yet, uh, presumptions of exclusive ownership and validity, um, some potentially better remedies if you ever did have to enforce your rights. You're allowed to use the R in the circle symbol, which you've probably seen, that conveys that it is a registered mark. Um, and while there is typically some back and forth with the trademark office, uh, getting a trademark is, uh, tra trademark registration is not nearly as um, difficult typically as getting a patent. The costs are also overall less. So when to contact your friendly neighborhood trademark attorney if uh, you are uh, launching a, a new game. So um, if you're dealing with an original brand, so you're coming up with an original name, logo, slogan, whatever uh, for your game then ideally you're going to do some clearance searching on the front end before you're really committed to that trademark element. Because the last thing that you want is to have an entire you know, container uh, shipment of a product on the way over from uh, the manufacturer uh, you're about to launch and then you get the cease and desist letter from someone uh, who you're accidentally infringing. On. So you can do some clearance searching on the front end, make sure that the mark you want to adopt is clear, low risk, no one's going to complain. Uh, if it looks clear, then you could potentially file a trademark app application several years before you're going to be at market. What that does, it allows you to reserve your rights to that trademark well in advance. So you don't have to wait until you go through all the expense and trouble of manufacturing, starting distribution, to only then you start to develop rights. You can file ahead of time, reserve the mark, and you know it's yours when you eventually do get to market. You know, initial cost, preparing and filing an application, if you're going to work with an attorney, um, you're probably looking at around $1,000. Um, part of that is, are the filing fees, and then the, and the, the other part would be the attorney time. Um, if a clearance search suggests that a mark is not available, uh, then well, you're probably going to suggest that you pick a new mark, and then you start the clearance process over again until you can find one that does appear clear. If, however, you're going to be, you want to use a licensed brand, so going back to those silly you know, concepts at the top of the talk, the um, Game of Thrones, 
uh, deck builder, for example. You don't own the Game of Thrones brand, okay? Uh, you want to use it, though, so you would approach the brand owner and request a license. Trademark license, similar to a patent license that Dave was talking about a moment ago, it grants you the right to use someone else's brand with your products. If you can reach agreeable terms, it's going to be a contract. Uh, everybody signs. You now have the rights for some period of time. You're probably going to have to pay some sort of uh, royalty payment, either a flat fee or tied to sales, um, and then you can proceed. Uh, if, however, the other party refuses to grant you a license or you just can't agree on terms that are you know, economically viable for you, well, then you can't use that brand and you need to select a different brand, again, either a third party brand that you can reach a, a license deal on or come up with your own brand. Um, common issues that we see, um, even with brands that are not registered, you're still allowed to use the TM symbol, not the R in the circle symbol, that's for registered trademarks, but even unregistered trademarks, you can use the TM symbol, you can put it next to your, uh, the name of your game, next to any logos, slogans, that sort of thing, just to convey that it is your trademark, okay? Trademark rights, again, they begin upon use. You do not need a federal registration uh, just to use the TM symbol. Other issues that we see are people not searching uh, or clearing uh, their brands before they really commit to them. Uh, there are lots of examples of people coming out with, with games and then all of a sudden um, they have to be uh, completely rebranded uh, because they got a sequence letter and that can resolve in significant cost uh, and disruption for your marketing plans. We see people not filing those trademark applications early so that they can reserve the rights to those marks in advance. Uh, unlike patents, you really do have to police your trademarks. You have to monitor the field, and if people are infringing on your trademark, it doesn't mean you have to sue everyone, but you have to at least make some effort uh, to uh, enforce your trademarks. If you fail to do that, then you could potentially over time lose your trademark rights. Uh, so it is important to do that. So typically we have a couple of cautionary tales. Uh, the one on the screen is about DC Comics, but I'll just share one that is uh, somewhat of an ancillary to trademark, but it's because we registered a trademark for uh, a client or took over a, an application. And that was for the tabletop game Tesla versus Edison. And uh, that drew the attention uh, because they're monitoring as you do in the trademark field for any infringing or, or competing registrations or uses that drew the attention of the Edison estate for that game designer. Uh, and the Edison estate extracts uh, six figure or seven figure deals to use Thomas Edison's imagery, name and likeness uh, in any, you know, name it Pepsi, Coca-Cola, GM, whoever, insert big company that wants to do an advertisement uh, that shows innovation, right? One of the things that they'll throw up on the screen in, in a tele television advertisement is Thomas Edison. So every time that happens, the Edison estate, uh, through what's called rights of publicity, uh, they have the right to control his name and likeness and its use uh, in association with goods in much the same way as trademark. Now, this is one of those rare differences where right of publicity law depends on what state you reside in when you pass away as to how long those rights can go. Thomas Edison has been dead for quite a long time. <laughs> Uh, but in some states, that right can go out to 75, 80 years. And uh, the Edison estate basically, again, uh, extracts licensing fees for the, the name and, and use of, of his name uh, in a trademark sense. So what happened is our company had gone up to Kickstarter, had had a successful Kickstarter, and in fact was at a convention when they got the cease and desist letter. And uh, thankfully, that story ends very well because our game designer and game company, but the lead designer, uh, made very uh, thematic games that try to evoke historical themes. So if you look at his game catalog that he developed over the last decade, uh, every game, and in this case, it was telling the story of the War of the Currents, right? The struggle between AC and DC power and which one would come out on top. Uh, so he was just basically a history nerd and having the chance to interface with the Edison estate, they in fact came to terms, a license was granted, um, in fact, an assignment of the trademark to the Edison estate happened because they don't like anybody to own that name other than them. But then a license back to our company to use the, the branding that they had come up with. And uh, in fact, that game is now sold in the gift shop if you go up to Massachusetts to the Edison estate. 
uh, you can buy that game in the gift shop. And our game designer, you know, hit it off really well with the principles of of the estate um, and went up and visited with them. And again, it turned into a happy story. But when we got that cease and desist letter, when they got the cease and desist letter and, and pointed it at us, uh, it was definitely not good times as they're standing on the, uh, the show floor of a convention selling the game and wondering if they're accumulating damages. Uh, so... Again, a little bit of searching goes a long way, uh, whether it's right of publicity or trademark. These are all types of things that a comprehensive trademark search uh, or a comprehensive brand clearance search will be able to identify for you. Uh, and unfortunately, that was not something that was done in advance on that case uh, or else that issue would have come up before they got the cease and desist letter. So, okay. uh, go ahead. So, yeah. so uh, any questions that have popped up? Uh, not yet, nope. Okay, great. So um, at this point, uh, you've got your mechanics, you've got a, a brand. Uh, at some point, you're also going to be developing all of the actual content of the game. That could be artwork, text, whatever. Uh, and that's where the next area of law comes in. That's copyright law. So copyright law protects not ideas, it doesn't protect concepts, it doesn't protect mechanics. Uh, it protects uh, the creative expression of those ideas. So as I said, text, artwork, uh, sculptures, mini figs, that sort of thing, software code. Um, and so in the game uh, uh, area, so this is going to be uh, artwork, drawings, photographs, uh, the actual text of rules, manuals, uh, figurines, mini figs, etc. Um, so uh, again, ideas, mechanics, concepts, facts, short phrases, those are not protected, uh, but all the expression otherwise is. And what copyright does is it allows you to prevent others from, as the word suggests, copying your content. So if someone else were to copy your text uh, or your artwork, they would infringe on your copyrights. And the nice thing about copyrights, similar to uh, trademarks, is that you do not need a registration to have a basic level of rights. As soon as you take the idea out of your brain, and you fix it in the world somehow, you express it, and you paint it on a canvas, you write it down, you save it on your computer, you record it, whatever, you automatically receive a basic level of copyright protection. Um, and uh, that term uh, for most works is your life plus 70 years. Uh, it's slightly different if we're talking about a corporate created work, uh, but, default, but the, the default is that they last a very, very long time. Uh, to illustrate the difference between ideas versus expression, okay, here's one example that we often use. So apples to apples, everyone's familiar with this casual, you know, party game. Um, well, a number of years uh, ago now, Cards Against Humanity came out. Mechanically, they are the exact same game. The idea, the concept of those two games is exactly the same, but the expression is different. So because there was no protection on the idea for the mechanics of Apple to Apples to Apples, Cards Against Humanity was allowed to copy all of those elements. It just came up with its own expression. The cards are original, the text on the cards, the collection of the text, the look of everything, all original. None of that was infringing on Apples to Apples uh, copyrights. Now, the same thing has happened to Cards Against Humanity. Uh, there are various other games that have since come out. Crabs Adjust Humidity uh, is one. Um, uh, kids against, uh, what's the, what's the title, Dave? Kids Against Maturity, thank you. Uh, it's another one that we've seen. Um, uh, again, copying the concept, copying the mechanics, they're allowed to do that because uh, those elements are not protected. Coming up with their own original content expression, that's fine. It's not an infringement on Cards Against Humanities, copyrights, or apples to apples. We do have a note there that there was a bit of a trademark spat between Cards Against Humanity and Crabs Adjust Humanity, but uh, that's beyond the scope of today's talk. So, uh, you can get a copyright registration for additional protection. Similar to a, a trademark uh, registration, you just get some extra benefits and rights. Uh, presumptions of validity, presumptions of exclusive ownership. Uh, the most important thing that a copyright registration gets you is that it allows you to actually sue someone for infringement. It's sort of like Wonka's golden ticket uh, into court, if you ever did have to sue somebody. You also get much better monetary remedies, potentially, uh, if you have your registration in, in advance of somebody ripping you off or within three months of publication of your game. Uh, if you have a registration, you can also work with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. 
if there are knockoff products coming in from overseas, they will find them, seize them, and destroy them or turn them back uh, to the uh, foreign port. Overall, copyright registrations are pretty inexpensive for the amount of protection that it gets you. It's about 600 bucks if you're going to work with an attorney. Again, part of that are governmental filing fees and the rest is attorney time. Um, cost or up and down, you know, lawyers cost different amounts, but that's a rough uh, estimate. So when to call your friendly neighborhood copyright attorney? Well, there are a few points that are, it would be pretty important. So number one, if you are hiring other people to create content for you, all right, then you're going to want to have a development agreement. Um, so that could be artwork, text, code, whatever. Um, and ideally, that development agreement will make sure that you end up owning everything. If it's not properly drafted, or if you don't have a written agreement, then those people that you are working with, they might actually own the content. Even though you're paying them, uh, and you might get a license to use the content, you won't actually own it, which is not ideal. Uh, if you want to use content from third parties, then you might need a license to do that, or it might be a fair use. Um, it, in other words, it, you might be allowed to use other people's content in limited circumstances uh, without getting permission or without paying any fees. Um, the full copyright fair use discussion is, is we probably don't have time for that today. If we have time at the end and there are questions, I'm happy to go through it. It is a pretty complicated doctrine. It is not as simple as, oh, if I only use 25% of someone's work, then I'm allowed to use it. Or if I change someone's work by 30%, I'm allowed to use it. No, it's, that's not copyright fair use. There's a lot of misinformation out there about it. There, there is, in is, fact, a separate Metatopia uh, panel about fair use uh, elsewhere in the program. What, and I, we do have I an additional commend it to everyone's attention. Yes. <laughs> we do have an additional question, though, which is: uh, Do you have to be, or should you be, incorporated before you apply for copyright? Um, so, uh, getting, coming up with a um, business entity, whether it's a corporation or an LLC, uh, if you're going into business, it's a good idea regardless, um, because what it does is it creates a layer of insulation between your personal assets and the business assets, so that if there's ever any dispute, it's not a perfect firewall, but it's at least some layer of protection between your personal assets. Um, that having been said, when you get a registration for a copyright or when you're just creating stuff, no. You can uh, create the stuff and then create um, the corporate entity, and then you can assign everything over to the corporate entity if you want to later on. Uh, that might mean if you already have copyright registrations, that might mean you have to um, record those assignments just so that there's a good clean chain of title uh, in the public record. Uh, but otherwise, no, you can create an entity later and then assign everything over. And the same also applies to trademark registrations and patent applications or patents that you do not have to incorporate before pursuing those. Everything that we're talking about today, they are assets. You know, they are pieces of the property that can be sold uh, just like anything else. Um, any other questions before we keep going? I think that covers this right now, yes. Great. Um, when your content is ready, when the game is basically done, that's when you would potentially file a copyright uh, application, um, either right when you're about to launch or shortly after launching. That's really the, the perfect window uh, in which to file. And that's because you want the game to be complete, because whatever you file with the Copyright Office, that's what the registration is going to cover. All right. On the other hand, you don't want to wait too long, because then there's risk that someone might start infringing on your rights and you don't have a registration. Yeah. Hopefully, you never suffer from you know, in, uh, being infringed upon, but if it ever does happen, then you could talk with a lawyer and they could assist you with sending a demand letter, uh, online takedown demands. If it's an um, online infringement of some sort, uh, that, that sort of thing, potentially even all the way to litigation, but um, litigation is pretty rare and pretty expensive. Though one of the nice things with copyright law is if you do have a registration in place and you sue somebody, they could potentially be responsible for paying your attorney's fees. So you are not out of pocket a penny by the end of the process, though it can be expensive and time consuming, consuming to get there mistakes that we see um, is people not putting a copyright notice on their games. You do not need a federal, a federal copyright registration to put a copyright notice on your content. There on the um, uh, indented um, dash there, uh, bullet point, is a complete full copyright notice. It's the word copyright, the circle C symbol, the year of publication or creation if it's an unpublished work, and then finally your name or the name of your company if you're doing all of this through a company. 
don't have to register anything with anybody to put the copyright notice on your work. It just alerts other people that this is your work, you claim it to be yours, and you consider it to be protected by copyright. Issues that we see are people pursuing federal registration after they're already being ripped off or infringed upon. Can you do that? Yes. Can you sue at that point? Yes, you absolutely can, but your potential remedies are not going to be nearly as strong uh, or lucrative, frankly. People often ask us about poor man's copyrights, or there are other terms for them, but in a nutshell, they talk about, you know, if I create something, then I seal it in an envelope and mail it to myself, and then I don't open that envelope, uh, does that give me any additional rights? The answer is no. That might have been a thing at some point in the history of copyright. It is not a thing under current law. Um, they're really the only two options are A, you create it and you uh, rely on your unregistered rights, uh, or B, you create it and then you get a federal copyright registration. Uh, people also um, struggle with what they can and cannot use from other sources. Um, so I already mentioned fair use, uh, and yes, if, uh, if there's another presentation on that topic, I strongly recommend it um, if you're working in this space. Uh, the other one, though, is uh, public domain content. So anything that was published in the U.S. prior to 1926 is in the public domain. The copyrights have definitely expired, and they are free for you to use without permission, without paying uh, a penny to anyone. Uh, and that year, 1926, that goes, that ticks forward every year that we tick forward in time. So next year, when Dave and I are doing these types of presentations, I'll say anything published before 1927. All right. Um, between 1927, 26, and um, 1978, that window, roughly that 50 year window, some of that is in the public domain, some of it is not. Uh, it's very complicated because the law has changed a lot over that time. Anything that was created after 78 is probably still protected by copyright. Uh, so you need a license or potentially rely on fair use. Finally, the last issue that we see is people just not owning what they commission. Um, again, you, you hire someone, you pay them money, they create content for you, but if you don't have a properly written agreement transferring ownership over to you, you might just get a license, uh, which might be enough for what you need to do, but it's not going to be ideal. And so uh, the other uh, area that protects the aesthetic appearance of games is design patents, which Dave is going to talk a little bit about. So in the U.S., we also have a bit of an outlier, which is design patents. And when people think of patents, they're typically thinking of utility patents, which we discussed earlier, that cover functional designs, mechanics, and things of that nature. But we also have a branch of patent law in the U.S. for designs, which just cover, again, it's very much like the expressions that are covered in copyright. It's the aesthetics or the ornamentality of a product rather than how it works and how it functions. Design patents can last 15 years from their issue date instead of their filing date. So they, depending on how long it takes to go through the patents examination process at the patent office, uh, they can last for quite some time. And essentially a design patent, if you look at it, is just a series of drawings. And to infringe that patent, you have to have something that is substantially the same uh, there is a doctrine of equivalence that can broaden your protection a little bit beyond what's shown in the drawings, but essentially you need to be a pretty close copy, which again puts us more in the realm of copyright type infringements as opposed to patents where uh, very much you can uh, read a little bit beyond the words and interpret the words of the claims in a utility patent. Uh, the drawings defining the scope of protection, and they're not being very much word written product in a design patent, the drawings do have to comply with a lot of formalities requirements, and the patent office in the U.S. tends to be quite picky because, again, that is the entirety of a design patent. Uh, so you do probably have to work with a design firm and or an attorney to make sure that those drawings will meet all the formalities requirements. Uh, they are much more inexpensive, though, because you don't have a lot of written word product. You don't have pages and pages of text describing functions. Uh, for that reason, you can secure a design patent for, you know, if you're using an attorney, 2,500 to 5,000, depending on how many different embodiments and the complexity. The issued patent, even if it's a design patent, still comes with all those same monopoly type rights. It's a fence of stopping making, using, selling, or otherwise importing or competing within the, the, com the country where you give it. And you do have to overcome those same hurdles of novelty and non-obviousness like you do in utility patents. Uh, one thing I will note for our international audience, uh, designs are protectable in many other countries, but they're protectable by registration, uh, which is much more, and they typically are 
close cousin to trademark and trade dress registrations. So they only go through formalities review. And really, if you go to enforce a registered design in another country, uh, that's where you'll fight over whether it's actually a valid design and enforceable. Whereas in the US, because it's handled under the patent system, you really have that battle with the patent office up front to find out if it's valid before you're ever granted the right. And I don't think we said it before, but if you don't have a design patent that's actually issued or you don't have a utility patent that's actually issued, you don't have any rights to exclude others. Um, and you can send a nasty gram letting people know that you have a pending patent application, uh, but you don't have any right to take them to court and you don't have anything you can enforce until it's issued. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there is significant overlap, especially depending on what country we're talking about with either a trade dress registration or copyright. So we've now reached the production stage, hooray, of our game development <laughs> lifecycle. We've, we've put all the pieces into place and I'll pause just to see if there's any questions uh, before we go into the next couple of little sections. Uh, no, we're good. Okay. So when we get to production at this point in, in the game development life cycle, we're pretty much going to kick over into contracts and uh, agreement law. Uh, but some things that you're going to want to button up before you actually uh, hit the manufacturer, hit the printer with your game. You're going to want to do one final checkup of all of your IP oriented rights. You're going to want to make sure that relative to artistic uh, things that you've gotten from third parties or licenses that you're securing of, of names and brands, have all of those companies and contractors that you want rights from assigned or licensed everything to you. Uh, and do you have the rights that you need to actually produce? It's a good double check just to make sure before you, you may risk infringement of either a contract with them uh, or just infringement of their intellectual property. The other thing that you're going to want to do, and it may be too late at this point, uh, depending on how long your development cycle was, it may be too late to file for patent, uh, but you certainly still have the right to file for trademark uh, or trade dress registrations. You still have the right to file on your copyright registration. So making sure that you've figured out, have I filed all of my own intellectual property registrations that I want to, uh, it's a good time to do that right before you're producing the game. Uh, and then the paths basically diverge, whether you're self-publishing your product or you're working with a third-party publisher. If you're self-publishing, well, I guess I'll start with the publisher. If you're working with a third-party publisher, almost everything's going to be in a, an agreement with them, uh, some sort of publishing or publication agreement. And this will define all of the various terms, including who owns the rights now and moving forward, how you're being compensated for the product that you're giving to them to produce, and what rights there are in, for, in future projects, whether that be expansions or even different uh, projects in the same field. Then if you're self-publishing, instead of having everything kind of funneled through a single agreement as to the production side of things, you're instead going to have to manage you know, what will seem like hundreds of different contracts. Uh, you will have to manage contracts uh, for relationships defining how you're working with distributors if you're going through that route. Uh, and if you're working with retailers all the way up to you know, the targets of the world, you're going to have agreements with them. And then also, of course, agreements with whoever's actually manufacturing and putting together the, the parts of your game. And each of those separate agreements or each of those separate business relationships really should be governed by a written contract uh, that, again, will have a lot of standard terms, but will also have things like intellectual property tied to them. And so we typically are still involved, even if it's just looking at the intellectual property side of agreements. Uh, but this is just the next step in the process. And really, uh, a lot of the legal work that then comes in is making sure that those contracts are either drafted or are revised to, to have the terms that the parties need, uh, because every contract is going to be a little bit different. And then you've produced the game uh, after many months of waiting and probably too much money. It has come over <laughs> on container if you're shipping it from overseas. Uh, and you're ready to release the game. Uh, at this point, essentially, uh, we've even moved a little bit beyond the 
the contract, the setting up of the contracts, but now you want to make sure that you're continuing to comply with all the duties that were in those contracts, the written agreements that we just talked about. And relative to brands uh, and things where you do have an active need to police or enforce your rights, you're going to want to make sure that you are monitoring the field to make sure, hey, is someone knocking me off? And if they are, is it something that I do have the rights to stop? And do I need to actively or do I want to go through the expense of trying to stop those infringements? Uh, and of course, this is just as much a business marketing side of things that is, as it is a legal side of things, but you can't lose sight of the, the legal things as you proceed into release and hopefully you know, then success in the commercial marketplace. We have a quick question here. Yep. Is it is it uh, both uh, possible to, and is it worth the time? Is it valuable uh, for uh, an RPG to trademark a setting separate from its mechanics? So settings are going to be a little tricky, and then maybe I'll I'll let Sean speak to this because that's going to blend a little bit over towards the original content side of things. But of course. Uh, you know, sometimes settings are a source identifier as well, right? That you would put on the, the outside of a book for an RPG. So, Sean, mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, setting can come in a different couple of different forms. It could just be, you know, we're setting this in um, 19th century London. You know, this is a very high level concept like that. You're not going to be able to protect that. Other people are going to be able to come out with their own. Uh, but if it's, you know, a truly original setting, you know, a fictitious world, for example, um, that could be a trademark, absolutely, for that uh, particular expansion, that series uh, in the RPG. Um, certainly, if there is any, for example, artwork or descriptive text surrounding it, that would also be protected by um, copyright law uh, for, for that setting. And is that cost effective for the, the budgets that most RPGs are working with? Yeah, so... It's really going to depend upon the value of that particular um, setting, again, whether you can even get trademark protection for it in the first place, uh, and B, how um, valuable is the is that work. You know, if, it's a, if it's a fairly low volume uh, thing that's going to be distributed, um, low dollar um, revenue, then no, you might not pursue uh, registration. You might just rely on your common law rights, uh, which again, in trademark law, are enforceable. You do not need a registration uh, for those rights. And always put okay. the TF symbol you know, next to it, no <laughs> matter what. So I will uh, note that we, we do kind of just have one slide, and we blitz a little bit through production and release. And that's partially because all of these contractual agreements, while very vital and, and a very important legal function that you might need attorney assistance for in certain cases, these are things that uh, they vary. They're, they're so different depending on the parties involved and the circumstance. So I will just say, make sure that before you sign any contract that has been drafted by someone else, that you do understand what you're signing yourself up for. That is probably the biggest concern that we have uh, for game developers is not understanding uh, what it is that they're agreeing to uh, in the written contract. But uh, otherwise, again, I will also just say that there's no such thing as a standard contract. There will certainly be big companies that will say they have a standard contract and you have to sign it, but every term is negotiable if it is of importance. So uh, that's another thing to consider with regard to that. And then we get to the expansion phase of our game development life cycle. And basically what happens here is we repeat many of the same steps again uh, that we outlined above. You need to, of course, be sensitive to any newly developed intellectual property for when you come up with an expansion, maybe there's new mechanics that you could file for a new patent on. Uh, there certainly could be new branding and or new, and there will be new artistic original expression that you could copyright. So you can re-secure new IP if the expansion or expansions are going to be a big deal to protect uh, commercially and legally. And then you also need to be sensitive to the fact that your expansion may still come up with new infringement grounds on other people's intellectual property and other people's rights. So you do have to double check and make sure, well, once again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure with a lot of this, uh, that you're not going to get a cease and desist letter 
uh, preferably not when you're standing on a show floor <laughs> or uh, having launched a successful Kickstarter and perhaps even funded a, a successful Kickstarter. So you are just kind of rebuilding the process, going through all the steps again to leverage that work and continue the revenue stream. So this is typically a, a case where, yes, the legal things still come in, but you're in a, a positive overall circumstance. So I skipped the Q&A slide. I put up our information there and I'll actually pull it down in a minute so you can see our faces again uh, full screen. But basically at this point, uh, we've gone through each of the, the game development phases, the types of intellectual property that would apply at those stages. And really now we can just open the floor to any questions we have for the last five minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we get any here. And while we wait on those to come in, I'll I'll also note that these slides are something that we we share with whoever. So whether it's through the the Twitch or or on Discord, um, you can track one of us down or via email and uh, ask for either these materials. We also have an intellectual property worksheet that we typically hand out when we're in person. That at least for this field lists a lot of different things that uh, are just kind of brainstorming, and it's a good worksheet to write down as you're developing. Oh, I've got this idea on a game name, I've got this rule book thing, um, and it'll classify uh, into different categories what type of IP or what type of legal concern that, that you want to work with. That's another document. It's just a one page PDF that I'm happy to share with anybody that needs it. Uh, and of course, when we're all in person again, uh, we're happy to field questions and, and help where we can. So I'll pull that down. We seem to have one question in progress here, so if we've got a moment to wait for it. Uh, to make sure if you sell online, uh, is common law trademark nationwide? Uh, if you are actually selling, if you've sold product nationwide, um, then yes. But if you just throw up a website that is a retail website, and so far you've only sold you know, in your region, uh, your tri-state region, for example, we're in Cincinnati, tri-state region, then no. Um, just, just putting up a website typically does not automatically give you uh, nationwide rights. Anybody else? I think we're good. Uh, thank you guys very much for, uh, for, for putting this on. And uh, if you want to uh, list one more time where people can find you if they want to reach you. Yeah, so uh, I can be reached via email. It's D for David Fitzgerald at WHE-law.com. That's for Wood, Heron, Evans, hyphen law.com. And uh, you can also reach me on Twitter and on Discord. I'm consistent there. My handle is Buckeye Fitzy uh, because I'm an Ohio State grad. So I've, I've stuck, my <laughs> stuck my identity to my alma mater. Uh, you can reach me there at any point as well. And my email address is S Owens, that's S O W E N S, same suffix as uh, Dave's at WHE law.com. Our, our firm website, WHE law.com, uh, you can find us through that as well. I hope this was helpful for everybody. Yep. And if there's any topics, I, I think this is one of many conventions that uh, we've been giving talks for, for 10 plus years now. And uh, whatever you want to hear, I'm happy to hear there is a separate fair use talk because that really does warrant its own uh, hour or sometimes more of conversation. But if there's any particular field that you want to hear a little bit more about, um, certainly feel free to put a bug in our ear and we'll try to come up with something for future conventions because we're, right. we're here to help the designers. Let, let Metatopia about. know uh, online on their Discord or that sort of thing for it, and uh, we'll be sure to pass the question along to uh, to all of our legal experts. Uh, uh, we have, I believe, uh, three different lawyers, uh, or sets of lawyers, uh, working over the course of the show. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll find the right person for you. Yeah. And with that said, I thank everybody for attending.